couple quick announcements. Um, this Saturday at 8 o'clock, men, it is the monthly men's breakfast. 8 a.m. this Saturday. This is, this is your notification. So guys, come on out. Uh, I'll make you breakfast. We'll learn a little bit about God, and I'll send you on your way. We're usually done by 9 o'clock. So come out and join us. Um, the children's Sunday school class, the early elementary Sunday school class, has been collecting items for Women's Action Resource Center. Maybe you've seen the box out there in the foyer. They're collecting uh, non-perishable foods, toiletries, and uh, winter gear. If you guys want to donate, please do that ASAP. They are taking it to work on Tuesday. So this is your last warning. That is going to be happening. And then on December 6th, Beulah will be having its annual walk around. And guys, this is, this is one of the activities that we get to partake in in the year. You know, the, the ladies get their ladies' Bible study. They get baking pies. We get the walk around where we get to engage the community. We get to see people face to face. We get to shake hands and we get to be the face of this church. And so December 6th, guys, we will be doing that. We'll be handing out peanuts. We'll be handing out mugs with the church's information on it. So I would encourage you, if you want to help, please come see me. I'll get you all the details. Um, there's lots more in the bulletin, uh, but I trust that you guys are capable of reading it, so I won't go through it all. At this time, if our ushers will come forward, we will receive the morning tithes and offerings. This is the first Sunday in Advent. Today is, uh, we light the first candle. This is a candle of hope. Advent is a time of waiting and hoping. We wait for the day when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus. We hope that everyone will come to know God and to worship God. When we look at the first candle, we remember God's promise. God promised to send a savior to the people. When we listen to our scripture reading, we hear what the prophet Isaiah wrote about God. God fulfills the promises made to care for people. God is loving and just. God brings peace. This gives us hope. We look forward to the time when everything is fair, when the world is at peace and all people are treated justly. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, said concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last day, the mountain of the Lord temple will be established. As the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted upon the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Would you pray with us? Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the words of the prophet Isaiah that remind us that you are the source of our hope. Help us to remember to walk in the light of the Lord. Amen.
could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you give us. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we pray for all these prayers that we have. Lord, I pray for those who are in need of healing. Lord, I pray that, that you would touch them. I pray for baby Drew, that you would continue to help her to grow and become strong. I pray for Jillian as she has undergone surgery this week. Lord, I pray that you would touch her and that you would bring healing, that you would give the doctors wisdom and that you would bring about a full recovery. Lord, we lift up Jaden as well as he's continuing to have struggles. Lord, I pray for your healing touch on him, be it through miraculous means or through a doctor's visit, whatever form that may take. Lord, I pray for your healing upon his life. Lord, I pray for our local law enforcement, those who are trying to keep the peace, those who are putting their own lives in danger to protect others. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, I pray that, that you would help them to safely come home to their families each and every night. Lord, we thank you for each and every one. We thank you for their service. And Lord, I pray for the protests that are going on. Lord, I pray for healing in relationships. Lord, these protests have caused a lot of animosity between groups of people. But Lord, you have called us above all else to love. And so Lord, that is my prayer that we would look upon people of different nationalities, of different ideologies, not in that way, but Lord, that we would love them as you first loved us. Lord, that is our prayer that especially during this Christmas season, this Advent season, when we prepare for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that we would show your love to one another. Lord, fill us with your love and your compassion. Fall on us this morning, Lord. As we enter the message, I pray that, the Lord, we would know that we felt your presence, that we heard from you. Be with us this day. In your name we pray. Amen. As we begin to change gears, we begin the trek towards Christmas. We begin the Advent season when we begin to prepare our hearts for the coming of our Lord and Savior. I've told you guys this before. Back long time ago, in a state far, far away, I grew up. And I've told you that in the sixth grade, that was the year of nicknames for me. I've already shared with you that that was the year that I received the nickname Rico Suave. And you guys had a good laugh at that. But that was not the only nickname that I received that year. That year, it was my first year in a brand new school. I, it was a, a small Christian school across the river, and my mom thought it would be good for us to go there. And it, it was a good time. But being the new kid, everyone wanted to get to know me. Everyone was trying to figure out who I was. And it was one day, while we were outside playing kickball for recess, that I received my second nickname. As I got up to kick, the ball came towards me, and I wound up as any good kicker would do. And I kicked that ball, and it soared over the heads of everybody in the outfield. And from that day on, everyone wanted me on their team. But it also earned me the nickname PK. No, it wasn't because I was a pastor's kid. My dad was far from being a pastor. But PK instead stood for power kicker. I know kids are very original. <laughs> 
But I was the favorite from that day on. I was the first one to be picked for kickball. Everybody wanted me on their team. And when I would get up to kick, everyone would get excited to see what would happen. However, it didn't take long before they all realized, just back up in the outfield, it'll be fine. And my 15 minutes of fame in the sixth grade were cut short. But for that moment, I was somebody. I was special. Each one of us wants to be special. We want to find that one thing that sets us apart. We want to find that one thing that we are good at, that we can be praised for, that we can receive adoration for. I mean, it's an important part of our development. It's an important part as we grow up that we can have those experiences, that we can identify and figure out who we are. They say that it's important for, for young children to be able to identify with their family as a group or with, with their gender. I remember in, with excitement as I brought my kids to the first men's breakfast, which is on Saturday, by the way. But my boys were excited to be able to go to men's breakfast because they got to be with the boys. They got to go because they were a boy. Mom didn't get to go. But they got to go because they were special. They were a guy. Each of us wants that thing. Each of us wants something that will set us apart. For some, maybe it's school. Maybe you excel at academics. For others, it's a sport or some other extracurricular activity. And for some, be it right or be it wrong, it's the group that you're associated with. Some find it in secret society. Some find it in religion. But they identify with that group that they are a part of. This was the case with the ancient Israelites. They were a special people. They prided themselves on being God's chosen people. And they weren't unjustified in thinking this. I mean, God pointedly told them, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I mean, God laid it on pretty thick, telling them repeatedly how special they were. I mean, that kind of praise, that could easily go to somebody's head. God repeatedly told them that they were chosen. He told them, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession." Now, it's understandable. They, they'd kind of get a swelled head with something like that. I mean, if, if somebody really important began referring to you as their treasured possession, I mean, that's got to inflate your ego at least a little bit. But these Israelites, it wasn't a one-time thing. They grew up generation after generation hearing these promises of God, being told, you are special, you are unique. Out of everybody, God chose you. It, it spans throughout their entire history, going back to their forefather, Abraham, or at that time he was still Abram. God called him and met with him and told him that he would bless him. Over the years, God promised many great things. But it all started with one conversation that God had with him. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open with me to Genesis chapter 12. If you don't have your Bibles, there's one in every row. And I'll have the words up on the screen. But I invite you to open it up yourselves to Genesis chapter 12. It's the very first book in the Bible in case you failed that one on Bible trivia. Genesis chapter 12, starting with verse 1. It reads, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God told Abraham, I am going to make you into a great nation. He pointedly told him, I am going to bless you. 
And he ultimately told him, however people treat you, that's how I'm going to treat them. If people bless you, I'm going to bless them. If people curse you, I will curse them. And we see this throughout history. We see when Abraham goes down to Egypt, Pharaoh takes his wife, unknowing that it's his wife, and God plagues him with diseases until he returns his wife. We see it again with King Abimelech, both Abraham and Isaac. You think the guy would have learned after the first time, maybe, but no, he fell for the same trick twice. Throughout history, we see these blessings and these curses falling on people. The Pharaoh in Egypt experienced the ten plagues for enslaving the Israelites. As they entered the promised land, city after city fell to Joshua's army under the Lord's guidance. Nations that rose up against Israel were destroyed by the power of God. However, everything wasn't peachy for the Israelites. They had their hard times, but even in their hard times, God was in their corner. Even with their lack of obedience, God was still with them. He kept his promises. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they were plagued with, with curses until they returned the ark along with guilt offerings. Israel was clearly God's chosen people. He had set them apart to be a nation of priests. But what was it that made them so dang special? I mean, Scripture tells us that Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. So that, that gives us kind of a, a reason of why God chose him. But really, why did God need a special people at all? The scriptures tell us that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God's love for all of mankind is shown throughout scriptures. He took care of the widow at Zarephath. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh that they might not be destroyed. And when God created mankind on that day, he called his creation very good. Each one of us belongs to God, and God clearly loves all people. Why then did he need one special group? Why did he need to set them apart from every other part of his creation? For the answer to this, we begin by looking to the Christmas tree. It's becoming that time of year, guys. If you have not begun to think of what to get your wife for Christmas... Here's your fair warning. You have about a month. But we're, we're about to enter that time. If you haven't begun to see the commercials already, we're going to see the commercials where the mom comes down on Christmas morning and, and opens that small box with a diamond necklace or, or a diamond ring or whatever it is inside. Flipping through the magazines, you'll, you'll see a picture of a snow-covered lawn and in the driveway is a beautiful brand new car with a huge bow on top. And those are the kind of gifts that we want to give. You know, we can't always accomplish that, but it doesn't stop us from wanting to give those good gifts. You know, it's been a few years ago, but Renee and I received a special gift like that one time. It was when Dylan was a baby. He was in the hospital. And due to his prolonged stay in the hospital, we were falling on some tough times. One day, Renee's mom came to visit us. And she had with her a small little package <coughs> wrapped up. And when we opened that package, when we opened that gift, we found inside a set of keys. Now, it wasn't anything special. It wasn't a brand new car. But we knew what it meant. That gift was special to us. That car, as beat up as it was, was our ticket to freedom. I don't know if you've ever received a gift like that. 
Maybe for your birthday or, or for a graduation present or whatever it may be. I was 18 when I opened a present from my family. I opened it up to find nothing but a piece of paper. Years before, I had, I had taken out a car loan with the help of my mom. And that, that loan was coming to its final payments. And for my birthday, my family decided to go in together and to make my final payments. And so I found in that package the title to my car. Now, a set of keys or a piece of paper, by themselves, they're not really anything special. I mean, if you received a simple piece of paper for a gift without a car behind it, it kind of loses its specialness. If you get a set of keys, but they really don't go to anything, it's really not that special. You see, while the key and the paper are special presents, the real gift is the car that lies behind them. While these, while these items are special, they are only special because of the gift that is implied from them. Likewise, God set aside his chosen people, Israel, as his prized possession. This wasn't because they were inherently better than any other group or nation. And many times they were just as corrupt as the rest of the world. However, the reason that they were special was because of what lied beyond them. God's explanation of this comes in his promises to Abraham. God tells Abraham, I am going to bless you. You will be a great nation. I will make you great. I will bless people because of you. I will curse people because of you. However, he concludes this promise by saying, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Much like the set of keys or the piece of paper, Israel was not inherently special. What made them special was the gift that would come through them, the Messiah that would save the world. Paul points this out in his letter to the Galatians. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. We're all familiar. I mean, being Christians, being in the church, we're, we're familiar with this idea. We hear it over and over, especially this time of year with the nativity story. I, I've made no secret about it. My favorite of the four Gospels is the Gospel of Luke. I love how Luke went to the effort of making sure that Every historical detail was in there. The extent of research that he went through to give us that gospel. But what I also love about that gospel is that it is the gospel to the Gentiles. While all the other ones, all the early Christians were Jews, Luke, being a Gentile himself, understood the significance of the Messiah to the Gentiles. And this is why in his story of the nativity, he includes when the angels come to the shepherds. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Just like God before him, this angel did not limit the blessing to just the Israelite people, to just the descendants of Abraham. He said, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all 
the people. Not some of the people, but all of the people. Regardless of nationality, regardless of age, regardless of wealth or fame or social position or education. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. It doesn't matter if you're white collar or blue collar. Heck, you don't even have to be an American. You can be Jamaican. You can be Russian. You can be Syrian. The good news is for everybody. This good news of great joy is for all people. Whether you believe it or not, this news is for you. God didn't say that this good news is only for those who will ultimately believe. This good news is for all the people. Sure, the great joy comes when you believe, but the news is for everybody. This is why Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This Christmas season, as we prepare our hearts for the coming of our Lord and Savior, I want us to remember this great love that God showed to all mankind. This love that that he showed through his promise to Abraham when he selected a special group of people, his, his prized possession. He did so so that the whole world might be blessed. God's love for you, God's love for all mankind was so great that even when he was selecting a special group, he had you in mind. He had all the generations to come in mind. Likewise, may we demonstrate that same love And this is the love that we celebrate during the Christmas season. That God so loved the world that he sent his son. As we prepare ourselves for the coming of our Lord and Savior. We look forward with anticipation and hope. He is our source of hope. It is good for us to remind ourselves of this often. That he is the reason that we have hope. God is eternal love and he wants to share that love with us and show that love through us. We are reminded of this love during this Christmas season. And we are reminded of this love every time that we partake in the sacraments of communion. When we do so, we are reaffirming the covenant that Jesus made with us and the sacrifice that he offered for us and our acceptance and our appreciation for that sacrifice. The price that he was willing to pay, the love that he showed to us. I heard a story this week. It comes from the book The Broken Way by Ann Voskamp. And in it she tells a story of, of her pastor's trip to Jerusalem. During his trip to Jerusalem, he had the opportunity to sit in an Orthodox Jewish classroom. And during that class, the rabbi began to teach them of the traditional marriage customs of the first century Jews. As he sat and he listened to that rabbi, the rabbi explained that when a young man found that one special woman that he wanted to marry, they would have a great feast And his father would pour him a cup of wine. He would pass it down to his son. And his son would take that cup. And in one hand, he would turn to address that special lady. And with all the sincerity and seriousness that comes with a vow before the Almighty God, he would hold out the cup of wine and ask for her hand in marriage. He would do that with these words, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which I offer to you. Isn't it amazing that those are the same words that Jesus used when he gathered with his disciples 
at the Last Supper, when he offered them this new covenant. He wasn't just sharing a meal with them. Christ was demonstrating his love, the love of a, of a groom for his bride. This is the love that we look to at Christmas. This is the love that we look to when we share communion together. 